the General Lewis Welp Detachment, and we meet down at the VFW on Huntoon, meet the last Thursday of every month, and it's open to any um, um, honorably discharged Marines, active duty uh, Marines, corpsmen, uh, and reserves. Okay, I always like to start these out with this thing by Ronald Reagan, and, and this, I think, is our obligation. And that is that freedom is never more than one generation away. You have to experience it to the loss to understand what it means to lose it. Uh, so it's one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. So this is a map of Topeka. And right here is, uh, you can see that white spot, is Iwo Jima. And you can see that from 21st Street up to about Interstate 70, and from where 470 and 70 come together and down past, right around Topeka Boulevard, where that goes through down there, that's about the size of Iwo Jima. Uh, eight square miles, about five and a quarter uh, miles long. And again, we had to take Iwo Jima because we had our bombers, our big bombers in the uh, Marianas, and uh, we had to get to Japan. We had to have fighter escorts, so we had to have some kind of uh, airfield in between Japan and uh, the Marianas to be able to escort the bombers in. Plus, then, if any of them are disabled, they need a place to land. So you kind of see that Iwo Jima is right on the direct path. Okay, I'd like to take a couple minutes talking about casualties of war. And this is really more of after the battle. Uh, the statistics in World War II are, are staggering. They just are staggering. On Iwo Jima alone, almost 7,000 Marines and uh, Navy personnel lost their lives. That doesn't count the 21,000 Japanese that lost their lives there. Now, of, what about, I, I always have to ask myself then, what about those that lived? And you, you know, kind of ask yourself, what kind of lives did sur sur uh, surviving combatants have? And I can tell you that they all have suffered their whole lives from uh, what is called survivor, survivor's guilt. And you spend every day of your life asking yourself, why me, why am I here, and not that person. The randomness, the violence in combat is, is that, it's just randomness. And it almost is like uh, pure luck that you're here or not here. Then the family, the family suffer what I think of as, as generational uh, grief. They don't know what happened. In World War II especially, they sent their kids off. They got a telegram. They had no idea uh, what happened to them. Uh, and uh, in many cases, didn't know even where their bodies were. So they had nothing. And it, um, it caused a lot of problems for people for years and years. And we're going to find out about some of those in a minute. But, but if you think about these losses, for every combatant that's lost, there's a witness, at least one witness, and there is a family left to ponder that loss. So today we have two men, one witness and one family member here to talk about that. So one of these, he would like for me to say that, but it's uh, my hero, Jim Friel. And Jim is a Iwo, Iwo Jima veteran, participated in three island campaigns. Uh, also, he uh, has had a family loss, and he lost his brother on Okinawa. Then there's Bill Giese. I keep wanting to pull an L, put an L on the back of Bill's name, but I it won't go. And he's the nephew of an Iwo Jima casualty, Sergeant Orville Matterham. Now, in spirit, Dave mentioned L.C. Crouch. L.C. is an Iwo Jima veteran who was with Orville when he was killed on Iwo Jima. And he, he lived through the whole, he survived the whole battle. The 36 days of combat, he survived it. But uh, I can tell you, he has had the most um, horrible survivors of guilt I believe I've ever witnessed in another veteran. Just really terrible. And one of the things that, that he felt so bad about was that Orville was his, his best friend. He was there when he died. And he was never able to contact the family to tell him what a great Marine he was. And it just absolutely eats him up. So I met him late summer, early uh, fall, and I'll call this my part of the story. 
I was doing the, the uh, library presentation for Veterans Day, so I went over and met L.C. And, you know, after spending an hour or so with him, I could see that he, you know, was really, really torn up. So I told him, I said, you know, I'm going to do everything I can to figure out if there are any family members left, and we'll hook you up with them. So I headed over to the library and told my wife, I'm heading over to the gynecological, 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 <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we can't understand. Department, gynecology department, and of course that, that threw the whole project of suspect when I said that, so she followed me over. But, but I'll tell you what, the, the library has some additions of things like Ancestor.com that you can't get at home. Uh, so I, um, I went to work and, and just started looking. Now it's a bit of a, of a review of what's happened in the Pacific. You know, we got into the war on Pearl Harbor, 1941. We needed airfields. We began this island hopping and leapfrogging kind of a tactic that started in 1942. We've already talked about Iwo Jima. We had Okinawa, April of 45. But at this point, there were four and a half million troops. Four and a half million troops, our troops, massed to tackle Japan. And the estimates were that we would lose about a million guys. That doesn't count the Japanese because they had trained and armed all the children, the women, everybody. They were going to fight to the last person. So then you got to ask yourself, well, did the A-bomb, was it really a good idea? Uh, but I want to show you some statistics. First of all, just due to the Japanese, 25 million people were killed in Asia and the Pacific. 25 million. Uh, this is one that, that will sort of bear out this fanaticism that the Japanese had. Here are um, 12 different campaigns, island campaigns, down the left-hand column. In the right-hand column, it says Japanese killed, and there's, there are two numbers. I can't quite get this guy at work. You can see there's a, there's a number here and a number here. The number on the right is how many Japanese were defending the island. The number on the left is how many was killed. So if you look down through these 12 campaigns, 11 of them, they were completely wiped out, or maybe just a handful left. So they were going to hang on. They were going to make it as difficult as they could for us. Now, this is a... Um, I don't want you to get into the details of this map. I just want to give you an idea of what the Marines had to do in the Pacific campaign. Here we've got uh, Asia proper with China. Uh, here's Japan up here by the 1945. So we started down here off New Guinea in the Solomons, uh, the Gilberts in 1942, and we just followed, the Marines followed that arrow path that Iwo Jima to Okinawa and finally into Japan. These over in the Philippines and the Dutch uh, uh, East Indies and New Guinea were more army um, campaigns. So the Marines just sort of went right up the middle. They, the, the Marine organization that tackled Iwo Jima was what was called the uh, Fifth Amphibious Corps. And you'll see it in, in history as VAC, but it's the Fifth Amphibious Corps, and it was only around about three years. A corps usually consists of two or three divisions. So in this case, they had three divisions. They had the third, the fourth, and the fifth. So Jim was in the fifth division. Then they, they put together the first provincial artillery group and they landed, they were attached to the 5th Division, and they landed with the 5th Division. And that's where L.C. and Orville were at that group. So they all landed in the same beach. And that beach was called Green Beach. And if you take a look at this left-hand picture of the landing plan, each of the beaches had colors. And Green Beach is right here next to Mount Serbashi. And that's where Jim and, and Orville and L.C. landed. Mount Suribashi was it's a tall, you can see it in the, in the video clip, tall mountain, and the Japanese had artillery in that area, shooting down onto the beach. A really an interesting sideline, and I, I hope we can, we can pull this out of Jim, but on top of Mount Suribashi was like the uh, epitome of what I'll call uh, Marine Corps uh, history, that, like an icon, and that is the raising of the flag on Mount Suribashi. And everybody has seen that. That really, to a Marine, is, is um, just personifies the Marine Corps. An interesting thing is that the last guy on the left was Ira Hayes, who was also kind of a folk hero, hero in, uh, in the Marine Corps. 
Jim and Ira Hayes were friends and knew each other, so it would be real interesting to hear um, about him. Okay, here's Jim's, that's what Jim looked like back in the good old days. <laughs> and here's his, his uh, company, his platoon. See that helmet in the back, third one from the left in the back, just the helmet, that's me. Oh, is it really? Oh. Oh, I wonder. Well, I was going to ask you this guy right here. Wow. I was bashful. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's good. That is good. Okay, that's the last one. Shoot, I want to talk more. I got more to say. <laughs> uh, okay, so I want to introduce uh, Bill. Bill, yesterday, I first met Bill yesterday at 3 o'clock. He had driven 650 miles uh, down from Wisconsin. Now, he's going to sound a little bit like a Canadian, but he, he, he swears to me he lives in Wisconsin, so we'll just, we'll just see. Thank you. My name is Bill Giese, and I'm from Wausau, Wisconsin. Do I sound funny? Maybe I do, I don't know. First, I want to, I want to thank Ted for everything he's done for our family. And you might think it's funny, that's, that this happened. In fact, I never met my uncle Orville. He was uh, uh, killed five years before I was born, and and, and I, I would have loved to meet him. And uh, my mother was two years older than Orville, and they were sister and brother, and she was very very fond of Orville, you know. And of course, his mother was. And I remember when I was six years old, I found an old book that the Marines had sent my grandmother, you know. I was a precocious reader. I wanted to read all the time, and I was really interested in this. And I was asking her questions. She started to cry. I was six years old. It was 1956. And I realized then that, you know, she didn't want to talk about this. And I had questions about what happened, and what was he like, and, and, and what did he do? Because you have to understand, in 1942, he joined the Marines right after Pearl Harbor. And my mom always said, you know, he was really mad. He was mad at the Japanese. And he was going to do something. I took it very personal. And so he joined the Marines, and we never saw him again. My family never saw him again. He left in 1942, February, January, January 1942, and he never came back. Uh, his body was returned to uh, the country in 1948. He's buried in Illinois, but uh, we never met him. But it, my, for my entire life, I wondered what happened. And I think all families, especially in World War II. Uh, all we ever got was a telegram that said, you know, that Orwell was killed somewhere in the South Pacific. It didn't say where. You know, we found out later it was Iwo Jima. And we never even knew what outfit he was from. Because they just kind of said, well, he was killed and that's that. And so I was never able to find out much. I could find, I mean, I knew he was killed, but I never could find out. And I really was interested in, in did he die alone? Was he with his buddies? You know, what happened? Did he suffer? Did he linger? Was he killed instantly? And it's not morbid, it's just something I always wanted to know. And uh, so like a, a blast from the past, he emails my sister, uh, and, and she calls me up and says, I don't know if this, what this guy, I, I just don't know, is it a scam? And I said, well, I think it's a scam. I said, don't call him, I'll see. And she was, you know, she's got, she's got the brains of the family, I got good looks. <laughs> so she was, and I said, well, I'm going to call him, and I called Ted, and lo and behold, L.C. was with Orville when he was killed. And, and it was, you know, a, a, a really a powerful moment for me, and, and for him too, because as, right before my eyes, he was reliving what happened to Orville. And it was very haunting. And he's quite a guy, a really good guy. And I hope he feels better now. Uh, his concern was that uh, when Orville was killed, he wanted to to make sure that his personal effects got back to my grandmother and grandfather. And uh, he stuck it in a canteen, and it did get back. So he had uh, his pictures of his girlfriend and some other pictures from the family. And uh, I think that put his mind at rest. But uh, to be able to talk to somebody that was in, and like I told him, uh, he lived through history. Uh, when you can think of a tough battle, I, I think you and Jima must, uh, what do you think? It's got to be right up there. Uh, you know, those guys really, really went through an awful lot for the country. And so it's just amazing that, that we were able to finally talk to somebody that was with Orville. Because for all those years, we never knew. And believe it or not, you know, my mother who died in 2011, till the day she died, she talked about Orville. She was really fond of Orville. 
And he was quite a good guy, I guess. And I, I wish I could have known him. But uh, it was certainly a powerful experience to meet LC. And so I feel better. I know what happened. I know he wasn't alone. And I think the family, and my sister and my brother, we feel good about it now. Because that always was, was a question. And, and maybe you younger people might find it hard to believe. That, you know, you, you think about something like that for, for 60 years, but I, I thought about him a lot because he really sacrificed for the country. And uh, L.C. was quite a character. But I think he, as I said, I think he feels better about it now, too, because he, that bothered him for all those years, that he wanted to make sure that his personal effects got home to his family. So, um, it's been a tremendous experience for me, and I want to thank Ted again. It's been wonderful. And uh, I've had an awful lot of nice people in Kansas, but you don't have much snow here. <laughs> well, when I left uh, Wisconsin, I had to shovel corn into the snow so my wife could get out. And I have piles in my driveway about that high. <laughs> so it's been pretty cold. In fact, last week it was 32 below. Not wind chill. 32 below. Straight. So, uh, like I said, this is a, a wonderful experience. And uh, really, this is a, a history. You know, there's some, the World War II vets lived history. And so anything they can tell us is, is definitely something that, that we should listen to. And it's been a, a very good experience for me. I'm a, you know, I'm a, a retired history teacher. I could probably keep on talking, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stop. I'll let Jim talk a little bit because I think he's probably more interested in me. Thank you. One thing that you may have seen, uh, Jan Biles wrote a great article in the paper this morning, it's on the front page. If you go to the online edition, it's got a video of LC, and uh, it's really very, very good. She did a super good job, as usual, on that. Sound, too. Yeah, that's right. Okay, good luck. <laughs> One thing I know for sure that I don't have all. Oh, Fairweather friends get from looks of y'all here tonight, and I know about two thirds of you, I think. So appreciate you coming out in this kind of weather. And you don't have to worry about your uncle being a a good guy. He was a marine. He was a good guy. Never met a marine that wasn't. LC is one of my best friends here in town. Uh, he was very active in the Marine Corps leg as long as his health permitted it. Uh, if you ever get a chance to talk to him, he's a perfect gentleman, which you can't say for me, but <laughs> he's a great, great fellow to be around, interesting individual. And you mentioned um, a witness and, a, and the other, you know, yeah. about how you feel. Yeah. Well, I was wounded on the first day of battle and evacuated on the first day. I was on, on the land between oh, eight, ten hours from the time I was wounded until I got back to the ship. And LC was there for the entire thing. I had one buddy that made it to 36 days without getting killed. And I've heard him talk, and, and you mentioned what LC said about why me, why not me, you know, you know that sort of thing. It goes through your mind whenever you think about it. Um, they give me a bunch of questions to go through here, so if you get tired, why just stop me? I feel like the goat of this presentation, is that Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, he give me a list of subjects to talk about, and when we get through, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them or refer them to the experts in the back of the room. Uh, to my... <laughs> My buddies from the Marine Corps, they spent more time in the Marine Corps than I have. So, the one on the, my right back there is a career Marine. Uh, they got stories of their own to tell. Well, I was asked to, to start with what was life like before I went into the Marine Corps? Well, I was born on a cattle ranch here at Maple Hill, the old Adams Ranch, some of you may know of it. Come to Topeka when I was three years old, educated here in Topeka schools. If, uh, if you think I have an education, I, 
was the best they had to offer at the time, and I'm happy with it. <coughs> um, the war was, was, that was the time of the Depression. I lived through the Depression and, and the Dust Bowl era and all that. You probably heard a lot of people talk about that, what it was like to grow up during the Depression. Go to school hungry, and you didn't have uh, cafeterias in the school. You either carried your lunch or went home if you were close <coughs> enough. And um, very few people had work. You know, uh, those that did were always helpful of everybody else. There was no government handouts in those days or anything like that. Uh, people helped each other and worked together, much like they did after. Um, after a tornado or something, you know, how people mold and help each other. That's the way that everybody was then. But during the war, everybody was involved. Those that, that were in service, there were 16 million of us, so you got 16 million other people you could listen to beside me. And I was only one. I'm certainly not a hero. The heroes are those that, with the little white crosses above their remains. Marine Corps training, when I went into the Marine Corps, I enlisted and went down to Kansas City aboard a train. They put me on a Pullman train and shipped me off to California. And I thought to myself, here we got a Pullman train, sleeper coaches, dying in the dining room of the Pullman car dining rooms, and took two and a half days to make that trip. I thought, if the Marine Corps is all like this, this is going to be a ball. <laughs> But when I got there, I found it differently. <laughs> the minute you get off that bus, people start hollering at you. <laughs> You'll be sorry. You'll be sorry. And I thought, well, maybe there's, they think I'm sorry because I didn't get her sooner. <laughs> so you learned that that wasn't the case. Training was difficult. It was hard. They didn't have much time. Training uh, was uh, 12 weeks in, in boot camp. You uh, lived, we lived in Quonset huts. With, everything was clean. You had to do your own laundry, and if you didn't do it properly, the sergeant would throw it out on the ground and march the platoon back and forth on it so that you would do it right the next time. Uh, you did your share of head duty. That's what the Marine Corps calls the latrines. Um, they fed us good and regularly. But you just had so much time and back to the training and they, they taught you on all your hand weapons, rifles, pistols, uh, mortars, uh, and that sort of thing. Drill, 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 till you could almost do it in your sleep. In fact, sometimes you were in your sleep. Any little disruption of, of the routine and the whole platoon fell out to, to be reprimanded. So you didn't know whether you had any friends in the, in the unit or not, but everybody became one. You were a team. You were a Marine. The man on your right was a Marine. The man on your left was a Marine. And that's the way it went all the way through. You looked after each other because your life and their lives depended on you as you to them. There's a great bond that you formed right there in boot camp. A bond like no other. And I've been fortunate enough to be in law enforcement for 46 years. And that is the nearest thing that I could find in my lifetime or read about that compares to life in the Marine Corps. It's a fellowship like no other. When the first time I went overseas, we went aboard a troop ship <clears throat> from San Diego to uh, New Caledonia. It took 17 days on a troop ship. Now, the, the name of the ship at that time was the uh, <coughs> President Polk, which was a luxury liner and converted to a troop ship. So if you can imagine putting 1,700 Marines on, on a ship that was a, a regular troop ship, with bunks eight piled eight high on canvas bunks, and 
the idea was to sleep on the top bunk if you could make it. Because if you if you was on the bottom bunk, some fat guy ahead of you was laying in your belly. You didn't have room to turn over because you had to have your rifle with you and your sea bag. That's what we called what the army called barracks bags. But that and you were responsible for it. So with 17 days of having nothing to do but a little a calisthenics once a day on the top of the ship. And about the time you got up on deck, they would the Navy would call for a, a clean sweep down, fore and aft, and they'd come along with their brooms and hoses and get everything you had wet. It didn't, didn't create for goodwill between the Marine Corps and the Navy. But that, that, as I say, lasted 17 days and we got to New Caledonia. Uh, Oh, I neg ne neglected to tell you that after boot camp, I went through parachute training school, which was just like boot camp, only on a double. Everything was double time. Um, first six times I went up in an airplane, I had to jump out. But um, that's another story, and we'll get to a little bit of that later. After a couple months in New Caledonia, we were dispatched back to Guadalcanal, which had, that was the first island that the Marines attacked in when we started our counteroffensive. And it had been secured by that time, and we uh, trained there a little while before we went to Bella La Vela. Bella La Vela was a little island off the coast of Bougainville, a part of the Solomon chain. And it was the one you might have mentioned or might have seen up on the chart where there was only 200 uh, casualties. So it was very minor compared to some of the others. Then we went, for, that was, I was there on Thanksgiving Day in 1943. And on, on Christmas Day, we were across the, another island, Bougainville Island, attached to the 3rd Marine Division. Uh, now, uh, we were paratroopers at this time. And I was there Christmas Day, and my awakening on Christmas Day was an in, but, uh, initiation to my first uh, earthquake. Uh, Tokyo Rose had been promised and the Marines on Bougainville a big surprise for Christmas. And I thought, well, we'd been bombed and I couldn't hear a thing, but those little big mahogany trees were quivering. I spent Christmas Day there and uh, 44 days in that deal before we came back to uh, Guadalcanal, stayed there a while, and then come on back here. Paratroopers were disbanded, and uh, we were put into the 5th Marine Division. Along with the Marine Corps Raiders, who had been doing the same kind of work we were, same island, same, same uh, battle tactics, we were going in on landing craft, just like they were, only we were getting $50 more a month than they were. <laughs> but again, they didn't care for that. But anyway, after we got into the 5th Division, they divided us up amongst the various units. Uh, they mentioned Ira Hayes. He was in my platoon, my company, in uh, the paratroopers. Little short, stocky Indian kid. Very quiet. Uh, Always on a diet because he didn't want to get fat, so he wouldn't skip meals. But then he'd go over to PX and buy pork and beans and uh, crackers to eat. When we when we were uh, sent on leave after before we went to the division after we come back, he and I went down to the Martin Street there in not Martin Street. Uh,